What's going on everybody? Welcome back. Episode 5 of the Hydrogeology Playlist. Uh, so one announcement is I'm separating the gaming portion of my channel to GOS Gaming. And this one's GOS Geology from here on out. This is all geology on this playlist. Um, and this Hydrogeology Playlist should end up pretty long. Uh, this episode, episode 5, will be covering aquifer characteristics and homogeneity versus isotropy. And I'll explain the next couple episodes that I have planned for this playlist. But, uh, so, I thought this these couple images represent the same aquifers uh, underneath Memphis, Tennessee. And, uh, so you have alternating sequences of sands and different aquifers this one's a confining unit but it looks like it's a syncline these were probably all horizontal initially and then they were compressed into a syncline so i think it's kind of interesting uh, this is a confining unit and then you have loess and f which is basically wind-blown sands and fluvial deposits and then you have the mississippi river alluvium right here uh, overlying a confining unit and you also have the Mississippi River alluvium over here the Mississippi uh, sorry Memphis sand is probably a uh, pretty good aquifer and it recharges on these two sides of the uh, of the aquifer and then you have the flower island I don't know the geology of that but probably recharges there as well as if this is leaky uh, Fort Pillow sand is probably similar to the Memphis sand, so it recharges on these sides of each side of the the uh, syncline, and then this is a confining unit, and then you have a Cretaceous aquifer which is very deep, at 2,000, if not deeper, at its you know deepest extent, and then at 3,000 feet you have other Cretaceous units. Um, and then Paleozoic rocks. So I think this is a pretty interesting uh, cross section of, you know, the complexity that you can find in hydrogeology in terms of. Um, and, and there's a reason I put this is because we'll be getting into transmissivity, and uh, <clears throat> you can actually take all these and then add them together to figure out the total transmissivity throughout, you know, this aquifer. Anyways, so transmissivity, uh, measure of the amount of water that can be transmitted horizontally, not vertically, through a unit width by the full saturated thickness of the aquifer under a hydraulic gradient of 1. And it's important to recognize that we're only talking about uh, confined aquifers when we're talking about transmissivity. Okay, I'm having a hard time with that word. <laughs> transmissivity. There you go. Uh, so to calculate it, it's T equals BK and T equals transmissivity and B equals saturated thickness of the aquifer. So over here, you'll see it's pretty much the entire ex height of the aquifer and it's in length, which example would be foot transmissivity <laughs> would be feet squared per day or length squared per time. And then K equals hydraulic conductivity foot foot per day or length per uh, time. For a multi-layer aquifer like we showed in the previous uh, slide, the total transmissivity is the sum of the transmissivity of uh, each layer. Um, and then aquifer transmissivity is a concept that assumes flow through an aquifer to be horizontal and that's obviously not always the case you might have vertical flow in uh, some aquifers um, they're not always horizontal storativity s and so when the hydraulic head in a saturated aquifer a confining unit changes water uh, changes so the pressure uh, water will either be stored or expelled and the storage coefficient or storativity is the volume of water that a permeable unit will absorb or expel from storage per unit 
surface area per unit in the head, so it's dimensionless. So we have a unconfined aquifer. Uh, storage is going to equal to a specific yield in this case. And then in a confined aquifer, you have storativity. Um, you have a change in head. And as you're expelling water, you're, you're going to have a change in head. And you have this certain, you know, area, surface area. And then this is how you can calculate. Well, I'll go into this right now, but for a confined aquifer, that's how you calculate uh, storage. And then uh, storage calculated in a confined aquifer would be the saturated thickness multiplied by the specific storage. And elasticity, this is uh, something that you kind of go over when you study uh, structural geology, for example. But uh, in the saturated zone, the head creates pressure, which affects the arrangement of mineral grains. And this is called the mineral, mineral skeleton and the density of water in the voids. If the pressure increases, the military... <laughs> military? Híjole. Uh, the mineral skeleton expands. And if the pressure drops, the skeleton contracts. Uh, water will contract with an increase in pressure and will expand if the pressure drops. When the head in an aquifer or confining bed declines, the aquifer skeleton compresses, which reduces the effective porosity and expels the water. And uh, so if you compress these grains right here, you're going to push this water out of this pore, basically. But if you, re if you increase the pore space between this, then water should contract into those uh, pore spaces. Okay, so specific storage, SS, is the amount of water per unit volume of a saturated formulation that is stored or expelled from the storage owing to the compressibility of the mineral skeleton and pore water per unit change in head, also called the elastic storage coefficient. And then the formula to figure out storage, specific storage, is basic algebra. Um, you have the density of water, which is, uh, well, I, it, from what I remember, it was 1,000 uh, kilograms per meters cubed. I don't remember. But anyways, um, that's a, a constant. That that uh, that variable is a constant. Um, and then g is the acceleration of gravity. That's another constant. That's nine point eight one meters per second squared, I believe. I'm trying to remember my physics classes. But uh, and then you have that symbol is the compressor and we'll just call it a compressibility of the uh, aquifer skeleton and those are the dimensions one divided by the uh, the measurement which is a pound uh, length times time squared feet squared and then uh, you have porosity that symbol is porosity and that's going to be length cubed over length cubed so meter cubed over meter cubed and then you have beta well I guess a is alpha so B is this B is beta it's equal to the compressibility of the water and those are the dimensions and typically the specific storage is a very small number and this was actually a good opportunity to explain uh, so when we sample groundwater we have to do a uh, we have to purge three well volumes of water to get to this native groundwater to give us a uh, kind of a more representative uh, sample whereas if you take the stored water that's not representative of what's actually in the aquifer so we have to purge out basically what's called the target storage volume in this confining aquifer and then uh, and then th this is just a thin section of a poorly sorted uh, what probably is a sandstone um, you have little 
little grains filling in the the pores between these larger grains and if you compress them you know you expel water out of those pores and if for some reason this is unconsolidated and there's no compression going on then water can um, contract and fall into the pore spaces that exist so homogeneity versus heterogeneity a homogeneous unit is one that has the same properties at all locations so for example a sandstone that would have grain size distribution porosity uh, the same degree of cement and thickness which are only variable in small amounts and uh, transmissivity versus, uh, equals storativity in this case but it is very rare for homogeneous units to exist a heterogeneous uh, unit is when hydraulic properties change spatially so an example is a facies change obviously you uh, when you have a and you uh, petroleum geologist will like this portion you understand it but when you have an ocean depositing um, an, an active ocean you'll have sandstone depositing closer to these uh, to the the beach and then you'll have shale depositing pretty much at de more depth further off of the uh, further into the continental shelf and then uh, the limestone facies will form you know at the uh, extent of uh, where a reef would form so in deeper water basically um, so that's an example of heterogeneous units you'll have different hydraulic properties for each of these uh, facies and geologic processes operate at varying rates and over uneven terrain which results in uh, heterogeneous units and obviously heterogeneous is more common than homogeneous homogeneous is going to be very rare it's going to be very rare that you find well sorted materials like this but if you were to find it it would be uh, along the coast line where the uh, beach is due to wave action you have a uh, separation of the fine finer grains which are being carried out into the shell facies um, and those most likely quartz grains that are well rounded are occurring along the beach so isotropic versus anisotropic so isotropic in a porous medium made of spheres of the same diameter packed uniformly geometry of the voids is the same in all directions the intrinsic permeability of the unit is the same in all directions like i said that's not going to be very common that's going to be similar to homogeneous in that aspect um, and anisotropic is if the uh, geometry of the voids is not uniform there may be a direction in which intrinsic permeability is greater so for an example for that would be a porous medium composed of book-shaped grains arranged in sub-parallel manner would have a greater permeability parallel to the grains than crossing grain orientation and uh, basalts are very highly anisotropic because you'll have a uh, different uh, characteristics such as bubbles or um, what is that called Ah, I forget the term, but th they'll have bubbles form, and those gases trying to escape will form those bubbles, and uh, that won't occur throughout the entire basalt. It might occur in some areas, you know. Um, and then you you just have different. You when the basalt cools, you might have uh, columnar basalts form. Um, as it contracts, it'll fracture. If it expands, it'll fracture. Um, it'll be very uh, undulating. And th this is a good little chart to show. Basically, through if it's anisotropic and it's homogeneous, these vectors represent basically the uh, magnitude of how well water would be traveling through this particular uh, homogeneous material. And in this case, uh, well... This is probably flipped around. So th this is the horizontal direction and this is the vertical. 
this is say let's just say a shale uh, water flow would be better in the horizontal direction than it would in the vertical direction and if it's isotropic and homogeneous in this case they would basically be equal in all directions very rare heterogeneous and anisotropic it looks like vertical would be much better than horizontal and isotropic and heterogeneous you uh, basically have uh, you have pore spaces that are not equal in every aspect but um, flow and say this pore space right here would be equal and flow flow in this pore space would be equal but they are different magnitudes and uh, depending on where you're looking at in this particular unconsolidated sediment so thanks for watching um, in episode six we will learn how to utilize surfer and excel to create groundwater contours and i will plot the data i will plot just made up wells in qgis and then plot the data in excel um, and then obviously give them each point an elevation and then i'll show you how to uh, take that information and put it into surfer to create contours and then we'll export that into QGIS. I've never done it before, but I, I've used it for AutoCAD and it works pretty well. So we uh, will learn that together. And then from these contours, we will calculate the hydraulic gradient and then the, determine the general flow path. And then in episode seven, we will start digging into the principles of groundwater flow, such as the hydraulic head, Darcy's law and flow lines and flow nets. Thank y'all.